I inherited nearly every tool in this shop from my grandfather, and everything else that wasn't inherited was made by yours truly. Well, almost everything. I did buy this slitting saw arbor, but I made one crucial mistake when I ordered it. I have an inner cheapskate that usually compels me to make my own tools rather than buy them, and that cheapskate had a tight hold on my wallet at the time of this purchase. As a result, I ordered this bargain barrel arbor for a whopping $53. After trying to use it for a while now, I can say with a pretty high degree of confidence, it's the worst $53 I ever spent. There's so much wrong with this thing, just looking at it makes me angry. So, I'm going to do what the inner cheapskate told me to do in the first place, and just make my own. Hopefully, surely, I can do better. As much as I absolutely hate this attempt at a saw arbor, there are a few important lessons to learn from it. Firstly, it's no longer in one piece. It was when I received it, but I might have dismembered it a little. The arbor included these rings that were sort of stacked up in the middle and were backed by a spring. The idea was that these would allow you to use different saw blades with different arbor hole diameters. A really nice feature in theory, but the execution was, well, half-assed. There's so much play in these rings that using them to center the blade is quite literally a waste of time. Now I didn't intentionally remove these rings because they sucked. That was a result of another problem I ran into. Blades rest against this end face of the arbor, and that end face was originally way out of true. So it made the blades wobble all over the place while in use. But having a whole machine shop at my disposal, I tried to fix it. I chucked up the arbor in the lathe to face the end true, and in the process removed the minuscule amount of material that actually retained these rings within the arbor. Not exactly what I planned, but at least I now had an arbor that I could get to run true. But I left out the part where the R8 keyway wasn't long enough, causing it to bugger up and get caught in the spindle. That was a joy to remove the first time. Additionally, the threaded hole for the cap isn't even remotely on center, meaning it's a whole other chore to get that clamping evenly on the blade as well. At this point, the cheapskate is loudly shouting, I told you so. The last issue I discovered isn't actually a flaw, but a limitation. The arbor is really short. So short that I've ended up rubbing the part on the mill spindle in more than half the times that I've used it. Okay, okay, I think you get the point. This arbor has a lot of issues. But what am I going to do to make it better? Well, let's get into that right now. I'll give the original designer credit for one good decision. They included an R8 taper, as opposed to just a straight shank one would have to mount on a collet or other adapter. Mounting straight from an R8 is the best option for maximizing rigidity and minimizing runout, so I will be copying this on my version. I mentioned before that the multi-diameter blade hole adaptability was a good idea as well. My attempts will include a similar step centering boss, but all in one piece rather than a bunch of nested rings. I'm also going to make the boss significantly longer compared to the slim profiled rings, and this outside diameter will be a tight tolerance slip fit inside the end of the R8 arbor. The combination of all these features should be a huge improvement on the ability to center the saw blade. The centering boss will use the same spring from the old arbor, because Cheapskate says waste not want not, and to keep everything contained within the end of the new arbor, I'll include a short slot that will ride along a simple pressed in pin from the outside. The final piece of this new and improved arbor is the cap. The large end will match the diameter of the arbor and include a recessed area to clear the end of the step centering boss. Then, a narrow shank will extend through the middle of the boss and be centered by another slip fit. Lastly, a countersunk clearance hole will extend through the whole length of the part for a screw that threads into the bottom of the arbor bore. This screw will tighten the cap and thus tighten the blade all in one motion. I'm feeling pretty good about this design, so I'll finish out these drawings with all the needed dimensions and I can get to machining. Because of my aforementioned cheapskateness, I try my best to build my projects from material I already have. Fortunately for this one, I have some 4140 steel that will be perfect for the job. I'll start by cutting enough length to form the main arbor from, plus a little extra to hold on to while machining. Over at the lathe, I'll get this chucked up and start the usual way by facing and center drilling the end. Concentricity of all the features is going to be critical if I want this tool to be an actual upgrade to the janky one I bought. So I'll be turning all the outside features in one setup using the tailstock as support. 
whoa, sound the alarm bells, something is mega wrong here. There's a scary amount of deflection as the tailstock aligns the material. I could continue, but then I would be basically turning an inherent bow into the part, and as soon as I remove the tailstock, it will bow right back. Loosely checking the straightness of the stock shows the real problem. It may be hard to see on camera, but that's probably about a 20 thou bow in the middle, which is a bit much for my taste. I'm going to need to machine these another way, one that doesn't bend the stock. I like turning between centers. After center drilling the opposite end, I'll swap the three jaw chuck for a spindle center and a drive plate. Then I can mount the part between that center and the tailstock center with a drive dog on one end. But now there's another issue. I need about six inches of exposed material for machining, but the posts of the drive plate are too long. I could cut another longer piece of stock to start with, but that seems like a waste. So instead, I think I'll just cut the post shorter. This isn't the first time I've run into this issue, so I don't think this will be a bad decision. But if it is, that's a problem for future Brandon. Nothing like a good side project before you've even really gotten started. I can't turn these without a chuck, so it's right back on here with the three jaw. And after mounting the first post, I can part off the problematic excess length. And I'll also go ahead and bring in the radius form tool to round the end like the original. After doing the same on the second post to balance them out, I can get these mounted back on the drive plate then mount the drive plate back in the lathe and remount the material and drive dog. Assured that nothing is going to fly off here and whack me, I can finally begin working on turning the arbor. I'll start with some light passes to evaluate the tailstock alignment, and after a small adjustment to that, I can proceed with the rest of the cuts. Turning between centers like this allows the part to be held in a neutral state while I cut the shape out of it, meaning I'm not inducing any bending stresses in the material that would just bounce right back once I'm done. So even though the original stock was bowed, I can be confident that this arbor will come out straight. Once the major diameter is to size, I'll work on the shank. This is one of the critical aligning features of the arbor, and I only have a half thou window to aim for. So once I get it within about 10 thou, I give the material some time to come back down near room temperature before taking the final cuts. I'll turn away the reduced portion of the arbor shank, and then it's time to work on the taper. This taper angle is important because if I get it wrong, it won't work right in the mill. So I'll use the indicator displacement method to dial in the angle of the compound. Then scribe the stopping point with a threading tool. And finally switch to a regular insert tool to cut the taper. Once I reach that scribe line, I take a couple spring passes to ensure I truly cut the correct angle. Then give this a final polish with emery cloth to bring the finish up to par with the other turned surfaces. That wraps up what I can accomplish while turning between centers like this. But while I'm here, I will begin the parting cut while I can still easily measure from the end. To do the rest of the features, I'll need to use a chuck. Only this time, it will be the fore jaw, which will allow me to align the part on center line. I'll get the parting blade back on here to finish the parting cut, then take a cleanup pass across the face, and lastly, drill a starting hole for the bore that will accept the centering boss. I'll get to finishing this end in a bit, but first I need to work on the R8 side of this arbor. Again, aligning the part in the fore jaw, I can indicate both near the chuck and at the end, making it both concentric and parallel. Then I can work on the threaded draw bar hole in the end. First drilling the pilot hole for the tap, dropping a hefty lead in chamfer on the end, which will guide the draw bar. Then using the tap follower and wrench to thread the hole. And that's it for the lathe work. Let's go visit the mill for a bit. Up first is cutting the keyway on the R8 section of the arbor. While I'm tempted to use the rotary table and chuck adapter to hold this in the middle as I've done in the past, that just seems like way too much work for a single operation like this. Fortunately, I have a simpler idea. V-blocks. They aren't quite camera ready though, so give me just a minute to get them spruced up. Yeah, this is going to take more than a minute. Time for plan B. I wouldn't exactly recommend sandblasting on high precision parts, since this does induce stresses in the surfaces. Considering the neglect these blocks have seen, though, they will likely need to be ground in again anyway. But that's one side project I'm just not in the mood for today, and these are more than acceptable for what I need right now. With the V-blocks cleaned up, I can use them to clamp on opposite sides of the arbor, leaving just enough room for the keyway operation. I'll use the edge finder to locate the arbor center line and end, then cut the keyway in a single back and forth pass using a two flute end mill. While I'm here, I'll also go ahead and drill and ream the hole for the centering boss retaining pin. Alright, that's the R8 side finished. Let's see how it fits in the mill. 
That's perfect. Now this just leaves the final operations on the bore for the centering boss. One of the most important aspects of this arbor is that it holds a slitting saw blade perfectly straight and centered. Which means all the features on this end need to be straight and centered with the rest of the arbor. I could go through an extensive setup on the lathe to get it dialed in just right, but really the easiest way to guarantee alignment with the mill is to turn the features while it's mounted on the mill. That's right. I'm going to use the mill as a lathe. Sure it seems risky being this close to the end of the part, but I don't mind a little pressure. I'll get the boring head cutter mounted in the vise, balancing the load on the jaws with some material on the other side, then put a slight tilt on the cutter so I can do both the boring and facing operations without rubbing the insert. I'll want the cutting edge right on center line with the part while cutting, so I'll use an edge finder to pick up on the insert's face, then zero the DRO and lock the saddle down. I might as well change the x-axis to diameter so I don't get confused while working on the bore. Alright, let's see if this is actually going to work. First a facing pass on the end. A little squeaky, but not too bad. Let's do the bottom of the bore. Unfortunately my camera doesn't have x-ray vision to let you see what's going on in here, but I'm basically flattening out the conical bottom of this hole that was left by the drilling operation earlier. I'm taking this slow, just 5 thou at a time, but as I get a few passes in, something doesn't seem right. Whoops. I'll get this reset and try again. Hmm, that doesn't seem right either. Ah, a chipped cutter this time. This pointy insert probably isn't the best idea for a facing operation like this. So I'll try this insert instead with a much larger radius tip. Okay, now we're cooking. It sounds a lot better, and the chips dropping out of the bore are a lot more like I would expect. Just took a little trial and error, that's all. Before too long, I've got the bottom of the bore flattened out and cut to depth. Now it's time to move on to the more critical diameter. I don't have a z-axis DRO, so just to play it safe, I'm feeding out of the bore with each pass. I do have the power feed though, which makes getting a consistent chip and finish super easy. As I approach the final dimension, I start taking lighter and lighter cuts, verifying the diameter after each pass with telescoping bore gauges until... Wow, that's within a ten thousandth of an inch. I didn't even expect to get that close with the accuracy I have on the DRO. And on top of that, the finish came out absolutely amazing. I'm going to call this little adventure a success. There's just one more feature I need to do before calling this part complete. The threaded hole at the bottom of this bore. I'll get this centered up in the fore jaw again using the two-point indication method from before, then work through the drilling, chamfering, and tapping operations at the bottom of this bore. Despite the trouble I went through to turn this bore on the mill, the concentricity of this hole is slightly less critical, so doing this operation in a separate setup is more than acceptable. And with that, the first part is finally finished. Not exactly how I envisioned going about it, but we got there in the end. Now I can move on to the centering boss, which, hopefully, goes more to plan. I went ahead and cut enough stock for the cap as well, just to economize on holding material. This boss is short enough to be cut without tailstock support, so after facing the end, I can move right on to hogging away the outside. I'll get it within about 10 thou, then drill out the bore. And with everything roughed out, I can finish boring the ID to size. This is a locational feature that will keep the stem of the cap centered, so I'm taking my time here, bringing it within a few tenths of the final diameter. Finishing the outside is the same deal. As I take two thou passes approaching the final dimension, the finish is coming out remarkably smooth. But, naturally, that all went to hell on the final one thou pass. I just love it when that happens. Fortunately, I was going to emery cloth this surface to bring it in the last couple tenths anyway, making it a buttery smooth fit with the bore of the arbor. Wow, that might actually be one of my closest fitting slip fits to date. This is shaping up nicely. Speaking of shaping, time to shape the end of the centering boss, where I've included shallow steps at common diameters to accommodate different slitting saws. These diameters need to be just as precise as the rest of the features if I want them to actually be useful for centering the blades. So again, it's slow and steady here as I bring each one to dimension and length. Then that's all she wrote. Well, for this side at least. I'll part this off a little long, then I'll get this set up in the collet chuck to face the part to final length, and also cut a little locating pocket in the end for the spring I'll be using. That just leaves the final operation of milling the slot that will keep this boss retained within the arbor body. 
Only problem is, clamping in V-blocks doesn't give me any reference edges to find the center of the part. Luckily, this transfer punch has a nice close fit in the bore, and works nicely as a makeshift reference that gets me by before moving on to the slot. I actually felt pretty clever about this. That is, until I realized afterward I could have just clamped by the flats of the jaw faces and saved myself the riddle. Duh. At any rate, it works and the centering boss is complete. And naturally, I can't resist seeing how it fits in the arbor again. Oh yeah, that's really nice. The final component to make is the cap, but it isn't exactly the most straightforward part to machine. You'll see why shortly. I'll get the remainder of the stock from before set up in the three jaw chuck and start roughing out the shape. First facing the end and turning down the major diameter, then hogging away the bulk of the material around the stem of the cap, again leaving 10 thou for finishing passes. And that's where the easy stuff ends and the fun stuff begins. This stem continues another quarter inch into the top of the cap and forms a square profile cavity. But I can't just mount up any old tool to do this. Come to think of it, this is a new operation for me altogether. It's time to try my hand at trepanning. If you're not familiar, trepanning is a grooving operation but in an axial direction as opposed to the more common radial direction. And because of this axial movement, a special tool is needed that will give me appropriate material clearances. A special tool that I don't have. You know what that means. To start, I need a narrow square profile cut on the end of a piece of high speed steel. This requires a huge amount of material to be removed, so rather than spending an hour at the bench grinder hogging all that out, I'll make quick work of this with the angle grinder. Now the idea of this tool is that it has to cut a circular groove, in my case a 1 inch OD. So you can see I still have a little more to remove on the bottom to give the adequate clearance. I'll lop this off as well with the angle grinder, then it's over to the bench grinder for the fine tuning. Here I can generally smooth out all the clearance facets, then bring the width down to size, and also square up the end. Lastly, I'll put a little bit of rake angle on the cutting edge that will allow the tool to form a good chip and thus a good cut. It might look a bit odd, but all the important things are there. So let's see if this is actually going to work. I'll get the tool set up such that the end face is square with the work and lock it down. Then, moment of truth. It works. It really works. Just look at that deliciously chunky and consistent chip. It's so good. And there isn't even a temptation of chatter. Something I was kind of worried about with how wide this cut is. I think I may have just found my new favorite operation. After cutting the idea of the groove, I'll also bring the tool in and cut the remainder of the material next to the stem. And that's the trepanning complete. I honestly couldn't have asked for that to go more smoothly. But I'm not quite in the clear. I still have the stem to turn down to the final diameter. That includes the portion that extends into the bottom of the groove. My smallest pointiest cutter isn't going to get the job done, so guess what that means. Okay, so while it looks like I just made another trepanning tool, I assure you that isn't the case. This tool has both back and side rake angles and a nice radius on the corner, all of which make it more suited for cutting on the side rather than the end like the trepanning tool. I'll get this mounted up and start removing the last 10 thou off the stem all the way to the bottom of the groove. Again, I'm impressed with how smoothly this tool cuts as well. It has no problem taking even half thou passes off the diameter as I bring it in for a perfect fit with the bore I made in the centering boss. And with that, all the really critical features are in the bag. This just leaves the last few operations. First drilling the through hole for the screw, parting the cap off from the stock, then remounting the stem by the collet chuck, facing the end of length, putting a nice honking chamfer on the outside edge, and lastly countersinking the hole making a flush fit for the flathead screw. Then that's the penultimate part of this build complete. Yes, penultimate. The very last bit I need to hold this all together is the pin that gets press fit into this hole. I'll chuck up an unnecessarily long length of quarter inch A2 steel, because well, that's what I have, and cut this down to exactly 0.125 inches. This will give me a 2 thou press fit in the hole of the arbor which seems like enough. Once at diameter, I'll file a light lead in chamfer on here before parting it off, and lastly, remounting it in a smaller collet to deburr the opposite side. 
Okay, let's get this all together. Now, that truly is everything complete. And judging by how things fit together, this seems like a really successful build. But the true test will be with an actual slitting saw mounted. So it's over to the mill with this thing. The blade seems very well centered on the boss with hardly any free play. A good first sign. I'll get the cap tightened down and then we can spin this up. Wow. If there's any run out, it's beyond what I can see with my eyes alone. Dropping an indicator on here might spoil this for me, but it will be good to know if there is truly any run out in this. Okay, axially, I'm only getting a little over a thou of run out. But radially, it jumps as much as two thou from tooth to tooth. On average though, it hovers within a three thou window. So I'm guessing that these blade run outs are a result of blade quality and not my arbor. Or at least that's what I'm going to tell myself and I'm gonna call that a win. Despite a few changes of plan and trying my hand at a couple new techniques, this turned out just as good as I hoped. Now setting up slitting operations is gonna be so much less of a hassle, and I can actually be confident in the dimensions of the slots it will cut, something I couldn't count on with the old cheapo arbor. On top of it all, I didn't have to make one single trip to the box of shame. But now with this project complete, I do have one donation to make. The mistake here was not just making my own in the first place. Because if the cheapskate wants something done right, you have to do it yourself. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. You didn't really think I'd end this video without showing you this in action, did you? Oh yeah, this is going to do nicely. And now, thanks for watching and see you next time.